All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome to number four of our sustainable budget team. Uh, I want to point out something that I was thinking about on my way down here. We have now officially spent an entire workday together. This like will be eight hours at the end of today that we've spent on this work. That's awesome. Yeah. And you all did it for volunteering. That's great. I know. <laughs> Look at that. Hey, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tamales, some sodas. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank everyone for being here again this evening. Um, we have a PowerPoint. I'm going to go through. The first part of this meeting is really going to be informational. Uh, Jenny is here. Uh, last time it was requested that we have paper copies of the presentation. So Jenny's going to pass those along. Um, and we will have a time, as always, where you're going to work in a group. We polled some people informally to see, like, do you, should we mix up the groups? Do you want new groups? Um, and we heard by popular demand, stay with the groups that you ended up in the last time. And so we're going to do that for this, this time. We may shake it up in the next meeting, but for this meeting, by popular demand, everyone wanted to stay in the groups that they were in. So uh, that will be coming down the pipe in a little bit. So I always start with our vision and our mission. We start every board presentation with this as well. And sometimes people say, Heather, why are we doing this again? We've heard it five times tonight. Um, but I really believe that when we repeat things over and over again, it becomes part of who we are. And so I'm going to go over our vision. Our vision statement at Pajaro Valley is every student will graduate ready to share their unique skills and abilities and be a positive contributing member of their community and their world. That's like our big, the vision is always that big overarching, like this is our best thing we could ever dream to be. Our mission is more about how we get it done. And so our mission is we're committing to cultivating a nurturing environment where every student thrives academically, socially and emotionally, and empowering them to flourish in a dynamic and evolving world. So as we think through uh, the learning that we're gonna do today, we wanna carry the mission and the vision in our hearts. I put this up on the screen because we do have a growing popularity. Um, people are watching our meeting. And so this helps them know who's in the room as a reminder. Uh, thank you to all of our great representatives of the sustainable budget team. So the purpose of this team, and this is in case we have, I know we all know our purpose now, but we might have people tuning in for the first time. Um, our, the purpose of our team is to make collective recommendations to the Board of Education on how we use our resources to best serve students and maintain fiscal solvency in the face of declining enrollment over the next decade. We plan on presenting those recommendations in the January board meeting. Um, and that statement was the statement that we crafted in our first meeting together. We also said about our norms, and it's always a good practice, a best practice to review the norms with a team when you're working with a team uh, so that everyone remembers and refreshes, okay, this is what we committed to. These were also created by us in that first meeting. So the team norms are that students are our top priority, not our personal beliefs, but our students and what we think the people we're representing want for our students that we ensure equity of voice so every voice here matters, that we listen to understand and we don't listen just to respond, kind of waiting for yourself to say the next thing and you're not really listening. Uh, we want to be brave and ask questions and I think this team has been excellent at that. Uh, we want to have a safe space where people are empowered to use their voice and feel comfortable sharing. And we want to honor the diversity of community and lastly, always assume positive intent. Our problem statement that we also crafted together and that we're working to solve is that PVUSD is facing a significant challenge due to declining enrollment and the loss of one-time pandemic funding. To address this issue, we must reprioritize and reimagine our services to scale effectively and maximize available resources. Our goal is to maintain high quality educational offerings while ensuring equitable access for all students. To achieve this, we must implement solutions with transparency, ultimately positioning our district for success in a sustainable manner. Such lofty problem to solve. 
Um, and then we are going to be using our fist to five for reaching consensus when we have decisions that we have to make. That was very effective for us uh, last, last meeting when we worked to prioritize our priorities. So we are still on step number two of the problem solving model where we're gathering and analyzing information and data and providing context. Uh, today we may end up slipping a tiny bit into the analyzing potential causes. I think some of the um, things we're gonna discuss tonight will lend themselves to maybe saying, well, maybe this is something that led to that. Um, so, so maybe we'll dip our toes into three tonight. Our district goals are there. We always want to make sure that the decisions that we are making align with the goals of the district. These are our old goals. Um, I did bring forth new district goals to our last board meeting for a discussion item to the board. And I will be bringing them forward as an action item on the November 13th board meeting. So these goals may change although I would say they're not very far off from that. And, and really the heart of what we do, and I can't say this enough, the heart of what we do is educate children. And the California framework, which I'm gonna show in a little bit, really mandates that we're examining English, language arts, reading, writing, math, other things as well, but those, that's the heart of our accountability measures. So those goals align with that. We have our district LCAP goals. We love acronyms in education. So LCAP stands for Local Control Accountability Plan. And that is the plan that we uh, create together uh, as a community. There's representatives much like this team um, to say, here's the strategies and actions that we're going to engage in that we believe will help us to reach the district goals. Um, that LCAP plan aligns with how we allocate our funds. So all of our decisions also need to be based upon and tied into uh, supporting the LCAP. And then we set about on our first night together, um, identifying what our core values would be for allocating resources. So this is the guiding measure for this particular team. And we decided together that we were going to be student-centered, that we would ensure equity and access, that we would prioritize core educational goals, and that we would also always consider what our long-term investments, educational investments look like. And that means not just investing in like a building for the long-term, but investing in our students and what will give them the long-term longevity that they deserve from us. All right, so uh, last week, or two weeks ago, our last meeting, we had a meeting that we heard people say, this is really hard, this is really challenging. When we set forth to say, what are our priorities as a group? And what do we think our um, people, our community that we're representing prioritize as well? And so we had everyone look at um, different key components of our how we've selected to um, choose and, and spend our dollars to support our students. And then we kind of looked at, well, what's the priority though? We, and I like to say this over and over again, we can do anything. We can choose to do anything, but we cannot do everything. And that was part of this exercise is if, if we can do anything, but not everything, how do we collectively come up with a prioritization? So this was the actual in the moment data that we collected uh, from the groups as you work to set about what our priorities were. And so more succinctly, here is our order of ranked priorities by our sustainable budget team. And although we have our core values and, and they're aligned with you know what's best for students, how do we stay student-centered, how do we ensure equity and access, um, this is more specific. So we said that as a group, that teaching and learning was number one. So our core educational program, as defined by Ed Code, was the number one top priority of what we needed to do. We then said that we really value visual and performing arts for our students, that music, drama, choir, art, art design have a place in our schools and that we would never wanna not see a school that didn't have those things. And then we also said we value enrichment opportunities that's 
students should be going on field trips, that they should have act outdoor activities, that athletics was a key component as well. We also said that mental health was important and career and college connection and then family resources and then our educational options. And we define educational options as having an array of programming that students could select from, from online learning opportunities to maybe dual language programs uh, to CTE courses. So we still put all of these in the top seven. These are important, but we, we did come up with a rank order. And I do wanna note that that was a consensus um, activity. We didn't all get our number one or two, but as a consensus and after a lot of discussion, we all agreed that this was how we would um, approach our work going forward. So we're gonna take a look tonight at our priority number one, which is our core educational program as defined by ed code. Uh, this is the core and the heart of what we do. Uh, an educational organization exists for one purpose, and that is to educate our students in what we are defined by ed code to educate them in. We offer additional services as side-alongs and to help ensure access and equity. Uh, not every student needs those additional services. Those are services we provide um, to help children with access. So we have to keep that in mind as we look at what, what is our core mission and what is, um, when is it that we're getting helps and supports versus core mission. So if you look at this uh, framework, this is the California framework. The California framework defines per ed code what a school organization is responsible for for their students. You can see in the large circular bubbles, math in the red, science in the blue, and English and language arts in the yellow. And then within those circles, we have over overlapping areas um, like mathematical practices and different engagement opportunities, things that we know go alongside of that. But really at the heart is the math, the science, and the English language arts. Does anyone have questions about that? framework. Okay. So we want to keep that in mind. That's an important um, aspect. That, that's what we should align everything into. Now what I have before you is our accountability measure in California. In California, we are measured uh, by our California dashboard and every year we're required to have our students take the CASP assessment. And we assess our students in English language arts and math in grades three through eight and in grade 11. We also assess them in science, but that, that's only in two different grade levels throughout their um, entire experience. As you can see, PVUSD is in the bolded line. We've included in this slide other um, school districts near us as well as what the California average is, and then what the average performance is for uh, Santa Cruz County. I want you to take a minute to just kind of talk with your partner about what you're noticing or wondering um, about this data. So go ahead and talk, it's, a, it's some good data to talk about.
All right. I'm not going to spend a whole, whole ton of time dissecting, but um, I would be really appreciative to hear some of the share outs or thoughts that you had when you looked at that. I heard some, some good comments already. Any brave soul willing to share? No? Oh my goodness. No one wants to share what they talked about or any I notices, I wonders, like... We were wondering if we could get um, some pre-COVID measurements, just like for a comparison, um, to see kind of where we were at before. Yep, absolutely. The change in, in schooling mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. Yep. We've decreased since pre-pandemic. I mean, everyone has really, but we have, and, and I'll get that data for you, but just to shed a little light, we've decreased at a dramatically more rapid pace than um, our surrounding districts. Yeah. And our, um, our achievement gap has widened. Mm -hmm. Any other? Um, Nora. Oh. Oh, oh. No, we were just talking about, you know, like, because our district spans such a different like geographical area mm -hmm. and like going into Coralitas and further north into Aptos, like just super curious, like how this breaks down and where like the most support is and going into these other issues that our district mm -hmm. faces. Yep. That's a good, I wonder too. Um, what I would add is that um, I noticed that there is a decline from 20 in ELA, English language arts from 2021 to 2022. And I wonder, because um, that's the year after returning from mm -hmm. distance learning, how, like, what, why are we declining as students are being um, brought back into an instructional setting um, over time? And then um, contrastingly, we see that in mathematics, we're actually increasing ever so slightly. Um, and mathematics is gonna require, you know, skills that uh, overlap with English language arts. And just another wondering is like the percentage of students that took those exams during those years, like what percentage of the students actually did it. That is a very good and astute, I wonder, because when we brought students back for, for testing and who tested was very different than the total population because of the conditions we were in. So you mentioned that the achievement gap has widened, right? My question, and I guess it could be tied to declining enrollment, is um, what factors have changed in terms of like the socioeconomic makeup of our students? I know, you know, when you think about the cost of living going up, achievement gap could widen if you have like a larger range of affluent versus, you know, students below the poverty line. It's a great, I notice. And I wonder, kind of both. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyone else? I, I think one of the questions is if we see that like Santa Cruz County, they're, um, they're kind of stable. Have we had conversations with them regarding what is it that they're doing to keep that stability also and how we can support each other and collaborate a little bit more uh, in those areas? That is awesome. I love that. Yes, absolutely. When you see areas of success, that gives us pause and maybe further investigation that we can learn from each other. Absolutely. Yeah. So those are all questions that we're busily asking ourselves in, in our organization now. Um, and principals are leading those discussions and teachers are having them amongst themselves. But it really is, it does involve all of the community. Um, and there's so many different ways to examine that data and look at it and, you know, uh, ahas and I wonders and uh, what do we do next? And that's some of what we'll be looking at tonight is what do we do next? The, we want to address this. Um, you know, basically what we're saying is that one in five students meet standards. We, we want to improve that because we want to improve that outcome. And that's in ELA. In math, it's one in five, less than one in five. So it's something to think about because in previous slides, I'm going to go back to our framework. This is our mission that we need to accomplish for our students. 
And this is a measure of where we're on track. Now, is it the total measure? No, um, but it is our accountability measure. So I want to point this out too. Um, every year we are mandated for our students to have 180 days in school. Some districts do a little bit more. No district is allowed to do any less. And then we have to have a maxima or a meet the minimum number of minutes per school year. So these are the number of minutes that our students spend in school in each of the grade spans. I bring that up because we also have recommendations per educational code of how many minutes are recommended in a variety of areas. Now, California educational code is really interesting. Um, they have recommended minutes and there are actually only mandated minutes in one content area. PE. <laughs> <laughs> so the only mandate of minutes that we must meet is that our students are required to have 200 minutes every 10 days of school for PE. Um, you could have all 200 minutes and do one whole entire PE day, or you could do 10 minutes every day over the um, 10 days or you or 20 minutes, sorry. Or you can do an hour here and another hour there. It does not matter how you do that. It's just that they meet that number of minutes in uh, the 10 days. There are recommendations though for what would be best, best learning for students after a multitude of studies that um, our nation has engaged in for language arts and that's 1200 to 1500 minutes every 10 school days. For math it's 600 minutes per every 10 school days. Science is 1080 minutes per every 10 school days. Social science is six to 900 minutes per every 10 school days. And we've already talked about PE and ELD doesn't really have a recommendation except that most curriculums are written for 30 minutes of ELD per day. And it is mandated that ELD be provided to English language learners. That, that part is a mandate, but there's not a recommended number of minutes. For graduation, our students have to meet graduation requirements. And those graduation requirements are to have four years of English, three years of social studies, three years of math, three years of science, two years of a world language, two years of PE, a year of visual and performing arts, one year of career technical education, and one year of ethnic studies. And those are our local graduation requirements, state graduation requirements can be different. We have to meet the minimum state requirements, but um, school communities are allowed to have local graduation requirements as well. Um, like for instance, we add in community service hours for our students in order to graduate. Uh, and that is encouraged and by the California Department of Education to have local um, requirements because it kind of reflects what you value as a community and maybe what your community needs as well. So any um, ahas, I wonder, that's interesting. I knew this. I didn't know that. Why don't you take one minute and talk with your partner about that?
Okay. Anyone want to share a couple of I wonders or I notice or wow, that's really not what I thought it was? I just had a clarifying question for the recommended minutes. Is that more towards high school or is this in reference to middle school, elementary? One side of it is the recommendation for elementary. And then the other side is just how high school is. High school doesn't really have recommended minutes. This is a really interesting fact, fun fact here. Um, a high school, if they wanted to, could decide to spend two hours on math at, at the expense of English and only 30 minutes of English or vice versa. Uh, there, we are used to that period day. Um, but then, you know, recently block scheduling's come along or whatever. So there is flexibility there that often by our system designs uh, isn't taken advantage of, maybe. Or maybe it is. Mm -hmm. We okay. were we were just we were surprised by the recommendation for math. Um, we were surprised that science was significantly higher than math was, and that um, we expected science to be more on par with social science. But then we were looking at you know potential future careers for kids, and that mm -hmm. perhaps that's why. You know the big aha, which is not a aha because I knew it already, but you know <laughs> that there just aren't enough minutes <laughs> in our current school day to meet all of these and so creative thinking about how we can you know we're writing across the curriculum we're involving you know math and our science we're you know we're involving social science and our language arts um you know were you doing all of that in pe even i mean there are ways yeah. to get creative but i think the only way you're going to get anywhere close is if you really have thoughtful design and um are being as creative as possible with how you're building building the school day for yep. kids very well spoken, yes. And I think that's why if we go back to, whoops, I'm going forward, sorry. This slide, that's why the circles are all integrated is because I think there's the nod to, we can't teach it all without approaching this through an integration of content area as a best practice, but it's hard to do. Our teachers deserve a lot of props. <laughs> okay. I think it's actually around like multi multi subject teachers. They they do have a little bit more flexibility and freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when you're a single subject person, it's hard. You have to trust that. Oh, is this this is happening over there too? Because right. I can't I can't have the whole load, you know, on me. Or yeah. That, you know? Yeah. That's why yeah. I think um, there's studies on what's called teacher collective efficacy. And that's really about teachers coming together uh, to support one another through what they have to teach so that, that it can be more integrated. And we're like, I can't do this all on my own. I need help. We all need to work on it together. Yeah. Emily. I just think the difficulty really lies in I, my first eight years teaching was in the elementary school. So I mm -hmm. had all of my students for pretty much all of the day. So I could be more flexible with those minutes and I could yeah. be more thoughtful about integrating. But now at a middle school and we're kind of siloed you know yeah. and it's we do writing in like social studies and i know our science teachers are doing writing and doing eld integration as well but it's like where's you know the time for us to mm -hmm. actually truly collaborate to build something that would look like this yeah agreed many challenges that face us in education <laughs> Oops. okay so well, I think before I go to that and get everyone starting to focus on, on dollars, <laughs> um, what we're gonna look at next and what we said this meeting would be dedicated to is the total cost of some of our programming. Um, and the programming that we're gonna look at is the programming that we brought in, a, in a addition to through our ESSER dollars. So that one-time funding that we talked about at our last meeting that we used for community partnerships, we received so much money to help our students in a time of need. We didn't just use it in community partnerships. We also expanded services in the areas that we saw need in. Um, many districts spent their dollars in different ways because each community was different and had, had different um, needs that needed to be met. So we're not gonna look at the 
total programming of our whole entire budget. And I want to remind you at the be very beginning first meeting, we did talk about um, what the majority of our budget goes to, and it does go to salaries. What we're looking at now is just those kind of supplemental things that we do, um, and mainly the things that we brought in in addition to through our ESSER dollars. So this is not the total funding. And we're gonna take you through the total cost of programming in the areas that we looked at in our last time, those seven key areas that we all prioritize as number one, number two, number three, like that, okay? Um, at the end, you're gonna have a lot of time to discuss and work in your groups with some I notice and I wonders. So don't feel like you have to absorb everything right now, but I will talk you through some of what I'm showing. All right, so we are calling this our instructional supports and costs. So one of the things that happened during COVID is students didn't come to school. They were distance learning and it was very challenging to learn through a computer. That's one thing that we became quickly aware of. It was hard to teach through a computer. It was hard to learn through a computer. And when our students came back, we did notice the learning loss that they um, were struggling from not having access to instruction in person and that it really impacted them. And so one of the things that we did to help support that learning loss is we brought in reading interventions and supports. Uh, reading is always an area of focus. Uh, you notice that the minutes align to deeper and longer instruction in the area of reading and English language arts. Uh, we were very concerned when students came back that they had, did not and were not, did not have access to the curriculum and they were not on track. And so we brought in um, these instructional supports to help students. So specifically, one of our um, actions and strategies was to have reading intervention teachers who could support students who were not reading at grade level. And you'll notice that the total cost of that was $4,855,000 and some change. And we have now currently 36 full-time teachers, FTE is full-time employment or employees, um, it, in that wonderful reading intervention program, and they're doing a great job. Um, that was in addition to, we've always focused on reading intervention in this district. In 2019, in fact, we had 24 and a half FTE. So this was a strategy that at the time the district found very valuable, and so we added additional employees um, to help and support that. The numbers of students who were served over time uh, through this programming was 1,728 first through third graders. And they're receiving targeted skill support, mostly in literacy. Um, literacy, a lot of it was phonics. Phonics is the code to reading and how students learn how to decode the code. Um, and so that's a key fundamental part. And you have to have that phonics in place smoothly in order to reach comprehension. And so that the um, strategy there is let's get them really fluent so that then they can read to learn rather than learning to read. We also found instructional aids to be very valuable. Uh, our instructional aids are wonderful uh, supports to our students and to the teachers so that we can have smaller groups for small group targeted instruction. And so we engaged in having instructional aids and we currently spend about $2.2 million on instructional aids uh, and we have 36 FTE. You'll see where these dollars are coming from. Uh, initially, our funding source for some of these additional supports was our ESSER dollars, that one-time funding. Uh, but we noticed our students needed some more support and so we've kept that on and moved that into the general fund. We also pay for some of that through our title dollars. This is a good opportunity for me to explain title dollars. Um, and, and you will probably wanna hold this in your head because sometimes there's some um, misconceptions about that. Title dollars, there's title one, two, three, and four. We're mainly gonna talk title one right now. Title one dollars are dollars that schools receive to help support students who are traditionally struggling students. So English learner students, um, foster youth, 
any kind of minority group. Um, we receive a lot of title dollars in this district and the title dollars are meant to provide extra supports and services to students who need those extra supports and services. Title dollars are dollars that we get each year and then we allocate the funding trying to use strategies that we believe will really help the students and this is not um, a, a dollars that go away. They, don't, they, can, they stay with the student, they kind of do decline with enrollment um, but they have specific strategies you have to use. You cannot use title dollars for athletics or an athletics program or a football field. Title dollars are specific to helping the students achieve in English language arts, math, science, the ed code um, required pieces of a school district. Okay, So some, so some of these are, wow, we, we need extra supports at this school and so we're maybe going to hire a reading intervention teacher from title dollars. That would be a separate position from the general fund dollars. So those are dollars that we're not looking at reducing. In fact, we don't make those reductions. Are there questions on that? Were these school funds only offered for first through third grade and then pre-K and kindergarten? They were targeting, yes, early literacy. Do we know how many instructional aids there were in 2019-20? Do you have that? Jenny, we'll find that, right? Yeah. Okay. We also brought in coaches, also known as TOSAs, which is teacher on special assignment. Uh, teachers on special assignment are an excellent strategy of support for teachers. Usually the model is that the teacher on special assignment is a side along to a teacher in the classroom. So they can come and help them with uh, different strategies and actions that uh, might help students. Um, so th that is a, a research-based uh, strategy and it does work. So we have 15 full-time um, core content instructional coaches. A third of those coaches are paid from title funds. The rest are paid through unrestricted general funds. And when we look at number of students served, our coaches do track like how many students are they helping and supporting when they go and work with a teacher, directly with a teacher, because really the outcome ends up landing on the students. And so through their logs, we have 13,710 uh, students who would have been served and benefited from a teacher on special assignment. And the impact and outcomes that we look at for that is to improve tier one instruction through coaching. So tier one instruction is that first time instruction that a teacher engages in in the classroom. That's the first layer of support. And just like um, someone, even golf pros, have a coach to help them like, okay, move your wrist a tiny bit this way. I think you'll hit the bar farther, farther or straighter. Uh, a coach does the same type of thing for teachers, like, oh, maybe if you adjust this lesson this way, uh, that might be more effective for the students. And generally, our teachers really enjoy working with the coaches. So I know um, when we started the year, some of our TOSAs needed to temporarily place in classrooms. Are most of them back out of classrooms now, or are some mm -hmm. of them still in classrooms? Yeah, we were able to hire. There are some still back in classrooms and some who have chosen to remain in the classroom. Um, and then I think there's a couple where you still have open positions, namely in science. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So the 15 are ones that are actively coaching right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No? No. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. And to answer, I know this question is coming. In 1920, we had 11. Yeah. Oh, instructional aids. Oh, sorry. Jenny is doing instructional aids back to this question right here where we have 36 in 1920 we had 11 <laughs> I thought we could do 20 2021 <laughs> uh, yes in our whole entire district Oh, good 
So that's a great question. So the FTE, which stands for full-time equivalent, so um, that could be made up of um, multiple um, uh, part-time employees that make up maybe like we have a 0.4 FTE or like a 0.6. So um, the total FTE that we have within our district is 36 FTE um, equivalent. It may not mean 36 individuals. It may be more uh, part-time in individuals that make that up. And I do want to note, though, for the instructional aides, when we look at the 1920 being 11 and now 36, an interesting thing happened uh, during COVID, and that is that we added TK. And TK that's our transitional kindergarten, has a mandate of for every 10 students, there's an adult. So instructional aides um, are accompanying our TK classrooms. And so some of those we, we would not make any changes to because that's the law. <laughs> and that's part of why that number is larger. Okay, so back to the coaches. Jenny, how many did we have in 2020? Okay, Jenny will get back to us on that. <laughs> okay, so that that was that number one. What how, what did we do to support our core teaching and learning? We really focused on the intervention, which makes sense because students came back not able to access tier one. So we were providing the intervention so that they could get the extra supports. Um, and that's how we chose to supplement um, during the pandemic. Priority number two, visual and performing arts. So in PVUSD, we have several ways that we help our students to be able to access VAPA. We've done a really great job with that and it's great to see that the alignment of our focus in getting these programs into classrooms also aligned with this committee, this team's view of what's number one important and what's number two important. Uh, so we have a program called Save the Music. We allocate $1.8 million for Save the Music. This is music in K through six, so elementary programming. We have our visual and performing arts programming that uh, from our unrestricted fund, we spend $1 million. And you see the number of students served that's uh, pretty close to our total population in the elementary. We have science, which we have a 1.1 million allocation that's coming from our unrestricted in general fund. And we focus on grades three through five. And then PE, where we have 717,000 uh, uh, from our unrestricted in general fund. And this is to help meet minimum state requirements for PE. Um, we put these as additional because these are uh, programmings that are above and beyond what a student receives from their core rostered teacher. So they leave the classroom to receive this additional um, art and music and VAPA. And any multiple subject teacher can teach art. This is over and above and, and what we've done is brought in specialist teachers uh, to provide a robust music programming or visual and performing arts programming. And in some cases, science and PE as over and above uh, for students. Yes. Those of us with sixth grades on our site that are served, like that number could go up or do you know if that in incorporates elementaries with science teachers with yes. sixth grade? It does. Okay. And then we have TK, our TK kiddos are getting much of that as well. Uh, yeah. That's counted, okay. Okay, great, yeah. And then you'll note it, so the grand total for uh, those additional opportunities for learning that we invest in is $4.7 million. I also want to call attention, and we had a discussion about this at our last meeting, to Prop 28. So Proposition 28 was a law that was voted in by voters a few years ago. And Proposition 28 allocates a per pupil dollar amount to school districts for the sole purpose of providing visual and performing arts instruction to our students. So our um, Proposition 28 allocation is $2.5 million. What Proposition 28 did is ensure that our students will always have access to arts of some sort. 
the other part of Proposition 28 is that 80 percent of those dollars must be spent on employees of the district. So it, in, it ensured that we were increasing our instruction in those areas. Yes, that is ongoing, although that amount will fluctuate from year to year depending on our um, per pupil enrollment. Nora. Just to clarify, the 2.5 million, is that in addition to the total cost or does that get like? Subtracted? That's in addition. So in the total total, when you add in Proposition 28, it, it is closer to 7 million. Okay, so I, the reason why we did it in two ways is because one is negotiable and the other is a non-negotiable <laughs> amount that we just get no matter what and we'll have that. It's not, um, we're not choosing an allocation or an allocation of this thing over that thing. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so that was priority number two and we are moving on to priority number three, which is our enrichment opportunities. Our enrichment opportunities include field trips, outdoor activities, and athletics. And yes, now you're all looking for how much? Where is the spending there? <laughs> uh, we did not include the allocation there because that one is actually not on the table for any kind of reduction. And so for the purpose of this team, we were like, well, it doesn't really make sense. Those are programming. That is programming that will remain intact. Um, athletics, our athletic programming is really right where it should be for our students. Um, and we know that athletics is incredibly important to student engagement, uh, particularly at the high school level. Uh, the other is our outdoor activities have long been accounted for in this district. Um, a lot of those activities are actually funded through our extended learning programming. Uh, and it's not a source that at this moment we have to be concerned about seeing a reduction in. And field trips are usually allocated at the site level. So those are things that we really wouldn't bring to this team um, because they're not ones where we, we would really have to make a decision about. If you have, like just out of curiosity, because now we have piqued your curiosity, we could come back with that information, but we didn't want to con convolute uh, tonight's discussion. So priority number four, mental health. Oh, by the way, I do want to say that like, since that's priority number three and it's not really an area to discuss, that's good news for this team, right? <laughs> We're going to be able to keep that one good. All right, priority number four is our mental health programming. Our total mental health allocation is currently $15.9 million a year. And here is a breakdown of how we spend those allocations. And in this chart, we also include what we were spending or what we had in place pre-pandemic and then what was added through one-time funding. Uh, I do want to note a couple of things about this is number one, uh, many, many districts, I would venture to say most, brought in additional mental health supports during the pandemic because that was a huge need. Um, I think not just children suffered from that, but uh, human beings, period, suffered from that. Uh, it was a time of great loss, isolation, and, and there was a need for this. So this is not um, unique to see that the spending increased for the mental health, um, for mental health. Additionally, what I'd like to note is uh, through grants and grant funding, PVUSD was, to, was able to find a variety of ways to keep this spending robust. Um, but there are still areas where we will have to have some discussions. But I do want to compliment the district because they've done a really nice job seeking out other funding sources to support our students. So in all, our students our staffing costs for mental health clinicians is $1.6 million. Uh, we, have in, in, we have eight now. In 2019, 2020, we had one mental health clinician. Uh, we were mainly using contracted services to support students with mental health needs. Uh, we, the funding source for adding these additional full-time equivalents is our one-time ESSER dollars. And our 
impact, like the number served, this is a really difficult number to get a hold of um, because it varies so much. Uh, a mental health clinician might see a student one time in the course of the year or may see another student 20 times in the course of the year. So it's, it's hard. Um, it varies by student, by school, by year. So it's kind of a tough number to track. Um, and, and what the income and what the outcomes that we look for for that is, is mental health clinicians being referred to a mental health clinician and seeing a mental health clinician is what we call a tier three strategy. So tier one students would be students who are having all their needs met through our, our regular programming. Tier two students are students who may need a type of intervention that is short term maybe from time to time, or maybe just a one time, like kind of a boost. And tier three students are students who have um, more intensive needs. And so th this mental health clinicians uh, generally see tier three students. We also have mental health clinicians that are assigned to working mainly with our students in special education. So we have seven FTE at a cost of $1.4 million. And these mental health clinicians are separate from the eight that we just talked about in that they only serve students with um, individual educational plans or IEPs. Social emotional counselors. These are counselors that were added um, through our one-time funding as well. And we have started uh, funding them uh, from the unrestricted general fund. In 2019, we had 12. Throughout the pandemic, we expanded this to 22. Um, our social emotional uh, counselors, their main role is to provide direct access for tier one and tier two students. So this is not a tier three strategy. Um, we do have some things that have now started in the state of California where we're allowed to bill for insurance companies for services for those students. So we are able to reimburse dollars for services rendered. Um, however, the amount of reimbursement does not match um, what we are currently spending. And then we have school psychologists. Our school psychologists uh, are, there's 19.5 and that is the same amount that was in generally in 2019, 2020, school psychologists are really responsible for um, supporting students through assessments um, at, that may later qualify them for specialized services. So it's not a psychologist like what you um, might see in times of trouble. It's more related to special education. And that's why that has stayed a steady number. Our special education numbers have been at a steady number for many years. We also, just to kind of flash us back to our discussion uh, two weeks ago when we looked at some of our contracted services, uh, in addition to the full-time employees that we have for mental health, we also contract with PVPSA, and we have PVPSA members here as a part of our community members. Uh, we, our total cost for 24-25 is $1.9 million. We have uh, been able to use our Learning Reco Recovery Blanc grant, which is also one-time dollars, though. That was dollars that were also associated with um, Learning Recovery for COVID, and those will be sunsetting. And PVPSA helps our Tier 3 students, and we do have some data there of how many students have been served, kind of what, what does the cost look like per student uh, for those services, and what's the percentage of students that we have served. Uh, Encompass is another mental health service that we help, uh, that we elicit to help our students, or enlist, I should say. 270,000 is spent there, and that is funded through grant dollars. We also have Effective School Solutions, and that cost is 562,500. Um, a third of that is funded through our community schools grant, and two thirds is is funded through our SB HIP grant. 
And you can see there the, the numbers of, service, of students served. We have good data. These um, consultants do keep really great data. That is helpful for us. Um, are those grants also sunshiny this year? The community schools grant is a five-year grant. Oh, that one's community schools. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the SB HIP, I, yeah, is also five years. Okay. So the only one going away is the loan. Oh, it's sunset. The SB HIP sunset. Oh, it's this. I thought we had years on that. That one's ending. Okay, mm -hmm. so ending at, as well as the loan and recovery block grant ending at the end of this year. Okay. Yeah. So, so to reiterate all three of these partners, the funding for that is sunsetting for all three. Yeah. Minus the community yeah. schools. But yeah, that could, but it will at have a finite time as well. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. yeah, good, very good question. Okay, so we have priority number five, our career and college connection. And this is bringing us back to last week. We looked at this. Um, we, we do have, as part of our regular programming, academic counselors at our high schools, uh, as well as our junior highs, who do a lot of work with college and career counseling. Our schools do invest in college and career access uh, through title dollars and other types of school-related funding, like site-based. Um, but in addition to that, we have enlisted Gear Up through our one-time funding, and that is uh, UCSC service. And it, we have people who work directly with us to look at our, um, our programming, our students, if they're on track to graduate, and to provide opportunities for students that are college related. And we spend $1.6 million on that. Okay, priority number six is our family resources. Uh, when we talked about this our, the last time we met and we looked at our family resources, we were looking at medical services or opportunities that we provide as outreach to families. We looked at social emotional opportunities that we also provide to our families outside of the school day, um, information that we get to them, and food security. One of the great ways that we've been doing this is through our PVUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Center. And that is a relatively new um, concept that we developed. It's located at the EA Hall campus. There are several portable buildings that are dedicated to uh, different family resources, including food insecurity, where families can go and um, basically grocery shop. It's really awesome. It's been a great thing. I was so lucky to um, be able to be part of the grand opening the very first week I was employed here. <laughs> so it, that's how new it is. <laughs> um, so anyway, we spend uh, $1.3 million on the Family Engagement and Wellness Service. That is what uh, the district contribution. We have other community partners who come alongside us and um, are helping to support what we are able to do at the Family Wellness Center as well, like Second Harvest Food Bank is one of our partners there. So here's some more on the Family Engagement and Wellness Center. Uh, this breaks down exactly what it is, the things that we do there, uh, and exactly where the spending is allocated. So some of the Family Wellness Center, $339,000 is from our LCAP, so that's our general fund, and it's been a strategy that we identified through LCAP as one that is useful and beneficial to our students. So that's why that is there. Uh, we use Title I dollars. We use Title IV dollars. Uh, we have ESSER dollars that are sun that just sunsetted, actually, as of September 30th, to help support that. Uh, we have the Learning Loss Recovery Block Grant, which will be ongoing for, for only the next three years. Uh, we have another grant that we are using, the EHCY grant. Um, we have a grant that we received recently from Kaiser for $100,000. Um, and 
the family, I don't know what that last $676 is. It looks like some discretionary <laughs> dollars that were used uh, to purchase something for an event, probably the grand opening event. <laughs> See how tra transparent we're being. <laughs> we're getting down to the, the dollars. So you mentioned that, I, is, it this, is it the Learning Loss Recovery Block Grant I thought was sunsetting this year, but then it says three years there? Is, or is that a different grant than the other? Loss so the learning loss recovery uh, block grant. So um, uh, we received the all in one year. Um, it's uh, tied to a multi year spending plan. So some of the um, supports and contracts, um, there's a plan in place to fund it through um, possibly um, through like 26, 27. Um, and some of the contracts might only be scheduled for um, one or two years. So um, each contractor service may have a differing uh, plan attached to it, but the block grant itself runs through uh, 26, 27, I believe, or 27, 28. So, so is it possible that like the district would then need to pull out general funds to pay for the contract with the food bank? Um, right now, I think Second Harvest is not actually the same thing. They are doing their own thing. <laughs> okay. I think their application is probably going to be different. Okay. Be I was just looking at the notes. The sunsetting is originally used to fund the MOU with the bank, with the food bank. Yeah, so for the Second Harvest Food Bank um, MOU, um, we have uh, a different grant um, that they've been able to um, go after and actually get this year. So that's absorbed the Second Harvest uh, Food Bank uh, cost that the district was incurring. Mm -hmm. I guess I just wanted to understand if like we're facing that being like ending in any way. That having to pay for it? The, uh, well, the Second Harvest Food Bank having a presence there, like being able to continue the, the food bank presence there. Okay. You, you bring a good question, and so Erica and I have uh, are working towards, you know, what does that look like? Um, with Second Harvest, they receive many grants to do the work that they do, and then an access point. In this case, we're more of an access point. Um, so we, we had a, we were supposed to have a meeting last week and we're, we weren't able to fulfill that, but I can bring more information back about where we're at with that. Yeah. There's a lot of information. <laughs> don't worry, you're gonna have time to look at it. Like I said, you don't have to digest it all now. Um, and then here's some more information about some partners that come alongside us for the Family Wellness Center. As you can see, it's a really robust center. Uh, a lot of um, community partners come alongside to help and support the community. We have in there our Second Harvest Food Bank Co-op, the number of individual families that have been impacted by their supports. We have our in-person uh, support by phone with SPLG and 1,800 students have been helped. PVPSA has been uh, has an office site there at the Wellness Center, and they've seen 50 um, different point. They've had 50 different points of service servicing unique students, uh, and then we also have um, CAB there working with us and. PVPSA running student groups as well, so kind of restorative circles approach. Uh, we do parent workshops, and we've had 648 parents um, come and, and get supports in a variety of ways, as well as our mental health clinicians um, who have served 21 unique families in addition to drop-ins for information. And uh, our other, I think our other points of contact where families come in maybe just for some information, direction to other resources, other supports that the Wellness Center can offer. And then here's just a little bit more information um, that this will be on our website too. So there's a link that you can follow uh, that talks about the community partners engaged with the Wellness Center, uh, the efforts that went into the wellness center and um, and what supports and services were able to provide to families because of it. 
Okay. So that was quite a lot. And you all have the presentation in front of you. And the clicker is here in case anyone over the next course of the next 30 minutes wants to come and grab it and see it up on the screen and not just up, not with your um, handouts. But what I'd like to do now is we, we just put a lot of information before you on different programming and the expenditures associated with that programming that we've used ESSER dollars and then found other creative ways to look at that. Uh, to be in all open and transparent conversation with you. These will be things that we may not have to remove completely, but that we may consider upon your recommendations seeing reductions in. But for tonight, we don't want to yet have that discussion because what we'd rather do is kind of focus on the merits of what's happening there and just some I notices, I wonders, what things do you see in these services or in the decisions that we've made uh, to support students that give you pause or give you celebration or um, make you want to ask next step questions or um, make you concerned? Uh, so what we'd like to do is get you into your small groups from before and I want you to divide. You're going to get a big post-it, just like last time, so we'll all be able to see our thinking. Divide the uh, paper in half longwise, and on one side, I want you to put your notices. So those are the things that are factual that you can see right in front of you. Like, I notice we um, have 14 employees in this area. And then your I wonders. I wonder why we have uh, 14 employees in this area, or I wonder what the impact might be of that uh, if we didn't have that, or th th those kinds of thoughts. So the notices are the facts, and the I wonders are maybe a next step, or something that's concerning, um, or something to really have under discussion as we make decisions. We are not gonna be making any type of recommendation tonight. Just like the last time we were here, we didn't make any recommendations. What we did do is come to consensus on our priorities. So this is just looking at other parts of our spending and programming that align with those priorities that we need to have awareness about. Any questions about that? Yes, sorry, could I just uh, ask a question? With regards to the data, there's just one outlier that I'd just like to confirm, and that's uh, the TOSA. Is the number served actually 13,710 because it is over double anything else that is on the... I the think data. that the TOSA data gets a little bang for its buck in the fact that it's one person who could go into a classroom of 30 students and that we're counting all 30 students being impacted by that, which is probably accurate. Except, yeah. uh, just breaking that down, that's yeah. 914 per full-time employee. That's five per day over 180 days of that. That sounds about right. Great, thank you. Yeah. The TOSAs ended up being one uh, one more now than in 2019, 2020. Yeah. It's a good strategy. Okay, so if you can even go into your same locations that you were in before with your group, we'll come around with post-its. And remember, we're doing I Notice and I Wonder. And me and Jenny and Claudia will be wandering around to answer any kinds of questions you might have or even just jump into discussion with you as well. We're going to take 25 minutes. So it's about 7.15 right now. We'll reconvene at 7.40. Okay, I'm going to ask us all to put our posters up. Put them somewhere near where you're located. And then I want you all to stand up by your poster.
Thank you to the group by the door. Thank you, Emily, over there for making movement. And if you'll, your group will join you by your poster, I would appreciate that. I know. I'm all, oh, we're five minutes over. <laughs> OK, I need this group to finish up their last thoughts and put it on the wall. And then what I'd like you to do is, as a group, you are going to travel to the other posters. We're going to do a gallery walk. I'm going to tell you when you have to move on. And what you can do is take your marking pen. Whoever had the power of the pen can continue having the power of the pen. And you're going to have a little bit of a discussion about the I notices and I wonders from the other groups. And if you see something that resonates with you, you're going to put a star by it. And you can star up every single thing the other group said. If you see something that you do not like, like your group disagrees with that wonder or that notice, then I want you to put a check by it. So star, yay, we love it. Um, or that's a good thought, or we hadn't thought that. A check means, uh, I'm not sure I really agree with what you noticed. I see it a different way. Or uh, I don't really like the direction that I wonder went in, OK? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so you're going to have three minutes only per station. And when I ask you to rotate because of time, I need you to really pay attention to that. That way I can get you all out of here on time. So right now is going to be your first rotation because you're standing at your own poster. So you're going to, okay, go ahead. You guys started going that way. So we're going to go this way to the next poster. And the three-minute timer is starting now. Now that I have a phone. <laughs> Be like Guatemala. And now that I have a phone back, I can set a timer. Oh my God. I, you know what? I kind of appreciated not having it there. And now I have 31 text messages. How many? 31. I'm an intern. I might have 15 clients. So we should have you explain that as an expert in the room right before we dismiss. Okay, and I'd like everybody to come back to the table. We have a couple last bits to do before we get to go home. <coughs> so the sooner we all come together, the sooner we leave. <laughs>
when we put this data on here, I guess we did not um, put equal data points by showing um, how many visits uh, for Encompass. So I did not put that number because this year is the first year. So, so just so you know that PBPSA is from last year. <coughs> and so last year for Encompass, we only had two people. So um, I cannot put the number of what having seven interns is like. We, we upped the ante this year. Um, but it's important to know that, you know, 120 students times, you know, sometimes it's eight visits, sometimes it's four visits, sometimes the students are there, sometimes they're not, sometimes it's 12 visits. So that's data we can bring back. I can um, show you how many visits we had from last year for two interns and then multiply it and or we can tell you how many visits they have so far. And they started on September uh, 5th, I think. Um, and then also it's important to know that um, this, the interns aren't assigned one student. Like, like if you have one intern that is seeing 15 students at a time, they are not seeing those same 15 students all year. They may rotate. Like one student, they no longer need to see them after eight weeks. And now they're seeing another student. So it's possible that an intern throughout a year, just like at, at PVPSA, could see, you know, 25 students. But how many visits, we didn't put on for the Encompass. So if you have any questions about that or if you need us to come back with how many visits. So that is an inaccurate. I saw something on there where the math was over $2,000 per visit. And on one of the posters, and I just wanted to make sure we can come back with the actual number of visits to help, but it's much closer to the $250 of the PBPSA. Can I ask a question? Can you let us know how much it's costing per student with the clinicians, and like that comparison rate to the reimbursement rate to insurances? Mm -hmm. Like, Medi like Medi-Cal, Kaiser, so. Mm -hmm. The data that we have for the clinicians is how many students they see and how many visits, and we can bring that, and it is, it is different by clinician, and we can look at an average, but we do have that data where they log in this uh, doc, in the uh, website called Paradigm, and they log those services. So we can bring that data back put it in the parking lot and then we'll make sure that one gets answered. Is there any, one of the things our group that kind of was looking them up is what evidence do we have that it's working? You know, that mm -hmm. it's actually moving students forward in a positive mm -hmm. direct, the direction either with their academics or with their mental health or with their ability mm -hmm. to have social emotional, positive social emotional connections with others. Mm -hmm. Do we, what, do we have any are we tracking that at all? Are we, you know, I, I don't know. It might be yeah. interesting. I don't know. I, I'm, I wonder if we have data capability for that. It might be interesting to track, like, a correlation between a student receiving mental health services and then if their academic uh, and also behavioral uh, outcomes improve. Mm -hmm. And so that is the kind of data that an MTSS team at a school um, provided um, folks are, are tracking that and having progress check-ins with the clinicians, that a site should be able to have that. If we don't have that, so that's a great question, then we have to look at how do we need to improve our systems with our mental health clinicians to make sure they're communicating well with the teams and so that everyone knows um, how to support that those students and when is it time to no longer um, have those services. So we say, okay, they've met their goal and now they're moving out. Like so. In that sense, it is definitely um, a site-based, and we can help strengthen those, but each site may be more clear than others. I love that. That's a good next step and something um, that could probably help us to understand more about ourselves. That's one thing like Jenny and I have talked about through this process. 
um, as we prepare for the data and we have questions and we're working with different teams of people in the district uh, for to prepare for these meetings, we're learning a lot about ourselves. And so it's great that we continue, can, can use this group to get better in a lot of ways, not just in looking at how we address our sunsetting ESSER dollars or our declining enrollment. That's great. Okay, any other questions or comments about the mental health clinicians or Encompass or PVPSA or any of the other services around mental health staffing. Any questions that you have, there is the parking lot that I put up so that you could put the questions there. That way we don't forget and we can bring them back for the next meeting. Okay, so we went through and we saw the I notices and the I wonders. And some of the I wonders do have points of like maybe some next steps that we might bring back. Um, like I said earlier, this is more an exercise in understanding what we've selected to spend funding or allocate funding on to help and support our students and a fresh look at, okay, what do we do next now that we know we have some budgetary issues to consider. Our next meeting will bring back answers to the questions that were posed, if we have them. It sounds like one next step might be to build in how do we um, better track the impact. Um, our next meeting will be looking at our programming and our staffing ratios. And like I said before, we're not at a point where we're making decisions. This is still the gathering of data, learning and understanding and, um, and having some conversations about that. So that as we get closer to the point where we're gonna make recommendations, we're making them with all the information we could have. Any other final last words? So the next meeting is next Wednesday. Yes. And the board meeting is two <clears throat> weeks. Mm -hmm. so Switched. Yeah, next week, we're back in one week. <laughs> All right, I wanna thank you each, You, everyone here is so participative and just doing a heavy lift on behalf of our community and it's late nights and it's a lot of them and yet you all keep coming. And so thank you so much. I really appreciate that level of engagement and I know your community appreciates it too. We do have a number of people that are growing who are watching these meetings from home, so. Um, know that you matter and you make a difference. Thank you. Good night.